The thing I wanted to discuss is uh, how do you convince someone that doesn't know anything about audio and video setups that uh, a professional audio and video setup is a great idea? Well, I think if you're doing any sort of presentation on a professional level, you owe it to your audience to provide them with decent quality in terms of audio and visuals. It doesn't have to be through the roof. Doesn't, you don't have to spend a lot of money necessarily, but you should do enough research that you can provide them something that doesn't assault their ears or their eyes. <laughs> something that's pleasant to listen to, pleasant to watch uh, in as much as possible. So again, I, I'm not necessarily a proponent to say you have to spend $20,000 to, to achieve this. My, my perspective is you probably should at least invest a little bit of effort and, um, you know, even just a hundred dollar investment in a microphone can make a massive difference. Yeah, you know, sometimes uh, we were shooting an interview and the guy was saying, well, I can shoot that with an iPhone. And I was telling him, yes, you can, but uh, there are things you cannot do with an iPhone. If you shoot with an iPhone, uh, well, with the same sort of uh, content, uh, forget about content. Uh, let's say that the content is there, but if you shoot with an iPhone, it's going to look cheap. There are things you cannot yeah. do with an iPhone. There are things that you cannot do with an iPhone. And, and I think the, um, there, there's an issue of credibility um, when you put together a presentation that, that has a little bit of polish, I think that adds to credibility. I think that, again, as I mentioned before, it just leads to a more pleasant experience for your audience. I think in particular, audio quality can make a, a massive difference. I think many people don't recognize that consciously, but if you go and watch, if you just pull up a video on YouTube, for example, if it has very poor sound quality, even if the visuals are very good, there's something that in most of our minds says, eh, this is kind of a homemade thing. Yeah, sounds cheap. Sounds cheap. It sounds like they didn't put a lot of effort into it. It's Or if there's the inverse, if you have very good sound quality, but the visuals are just so-so, a lot of times you'll retain your audience longer. You'll be able to get your message across to your audience, has been my experience. I was trying to explain this concept of the sound to uh person I was working with recently and I told him think about the difference between uh, what did I say Toyota Yaris and the Lamborghini or if you want to spend <laughs> <laughs> if you want to spend your holidays in a, in a hostel or in a, the San San Regis in the Maldives so it's about yeah the, the car takes you to from point A to point B you're still doing a holiday but it's not the same thing it's a different experience and then the guy said no we're not <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and one thing to to consider too is that that's part of I think that's part of what scares a lot of people away. Um, and my my contention is really you you don't necessarily have to go to a Lamborghini level, but um, there is a difference between the the hush hush motel and a Mar you know a Marriott courtyard. You know, and and you probably owe it to your audience to at least give them a Marriott courtyard. Talking about technical uh, technical side from the video perspective uh, there are things you cannot do with an iPhone or with a smartphone for example the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, lenses I know the new iPhones have uh, different uh, lens options but of course you cannot you cannot replace lenses you cannot achieve uh, depth of field you cannot uh, pull focus right uh, then what else maybe the color grading Color grading is a big problem. I think so, yeah, because I think a lot of them, uh, those those cameras in the phones, their dynamic range is usually fairly limited. And so that in combination with the fact that they're automatically exposing often leaves you with an image that is uncorrectable. You can't, you can't make it look especially nice. I mean, I, I'm not even going to go so far as to say you can't make it look cinematic, but with the default camera apps on most phones, you're going to get an image that looks very much like a, an inexpensive video image that's Usually, for example, what'll happen is the either the face will be underexposed or it will be greatly overexposed. Once it's overexposed, there's nothing you can do in color grading to fix that, really. Um, especially on you know the, with the eight bit images that they're providing. So there there are just a lot of technical challenges with those types of things. Can you shoot? Of course, you can shoot with your phone. You can shoot with your laptop. You can shoot you know with all these different devices that we all have. And in fact, I would say that it's better to shoot with those than to not shoot. But I would say at the very very least. Um, you can do something to improve the audio quality of your program, whatever it may be, by just adding a simple microphone for $100 or less. So there's some USB microphones that are very inexpensive that can greatly improve the overall experience for your audience. So yeah, for the phones, I, I know 
you know, there are, there are people do stunts. I would call them stunts where they show how amazing an image they can get out of a phone. And yes, if you're very skilled with your phone and you buy a third party camera app, you can, you can probably achieve some pretty impressive things with a phone. But when it comes to producing content or some sort of program on a reliable basis, especially if you're operating on your own, it's very difficult to do that with a phone. And I think the, the app you were mentioning is was called Filmic Pro or something that you can control the... You can, yeah, you can do, you can do white balance. You can manually set white balance. Um, you can do your focus. You can do the exposure. Um, you can control a lot. Um, even then, you're still constrained oftentimes by the dynamic range capability of the camera. The lightest, you know, the, the brightest to the darkest areas within your image, that range is much more narrow on a, on a mobile phone than it is on a camera with a much larger sensor. Yeah, and you're restricted to 8-bit color space, which means that you don't have enough colors. Instead, with a camera like the C200, you would have a 12-bit uh, color space if you're recording in RAW. In the proxy, it's still 8 bits, but it's a, it's a good one. Yeah, it is. It is good. <laughs> and you're starting with the advantage, too, of a, of a much larger sensor that has larger photo sites that can capture more light and so on and so forth. So there's just a lot of, I mean, it's really, a, it becomes an issue of up against the limits of physics. And, um, and also it becomes a practical issue, too, where operating a phone as a camera it just doesn't leave you a lot of options unless you really dig in. You can anyone could become an expert. They could download this Filmic Pro app. They could get to know that app. They could yeah. learn all the, the principles of it, you know, all the nuances of the iPhone or whatever phone you're using, sense, camera sensor, so on and so forth. But the question is, do you have time to do that? Do you have time to invest that much effort and um, to learn that much? So that's that's only that's a question that everyone has to answer for themselves. We said dynamic range, and then the other problem is the low light performance, and then you get lots of uh, compression artifacts in the phone, right? I mean, if you look at a video done with a phone with low light, not well exposed, in fact, most of the comparisons are done with the well lit uh, situations, right? Now, I wouldn't be quite as concerned for, for at least for talking head like what we're doing here, if you're doing an interview. Compression artifacts, generally not as much of an issue there as if it's well lit. Um, if it's not well lit, then it becomes a problem. But um, there's not a lot moving in a frame when it's just a talking head or an interview. So I'm not as concerned about that, but it is a factor as well. And then I think lighting is another big one too. That's one of the things, the challenges I find is that with webcams that are built into laptops or computers or iPhones or you know whatever kind of phone, if you do light it in the way that you would typically light something for a TV news program, for cinema, um, for a documentary film, that's where the cameras just cannot handle. They, those kind of cameras cannot handle, by those kind of cameras, I mean webcams cannot handle that amount of contrast. They just get very confused. Their algorithms for estimating what the exposure should be and setting that exposure do all sorts of really odd things. Yeah, like the one that and I'm so, using now that you're seeing now. That's rubbish. <laughs> well, that's the and, and the same with what you're seeing of me right now. No, same that's thing. <laughs> that's that's good. That's a great. What are you use? Do you do you have a Mac there? What do you have? Yeah, it's an iMac. Now we see, uh, well, on YouTube and almost everywhere, uh, people are uh, moving to all these. Uh, instead of doing proper interviews, they tend to do the Skype calls or Zoom calls, which is something that I don't really like. But I mean, that's because of the the <laughs> pandemic. And even if uh, the pandemic is over, kind of over, uh, somewhere it's over, uh, I would say almost over, uh, but people are still scared. So you need to do these Zoom calls or Skype calls. Basically, you're going to be facing uh, three situations, three scenarios. One is when your uh, uh, guest doesn't know anything about uh, audio video setup. Then you have the situation like uh, maybe uh, someone has a va an average idea of uh, audio and video setup, and then you have the case of the experienced people like the ones that you normally interview for example what suggestions can you give to someone that doesn't know anything so that they can deliver to me or to you something decent a couple of things first of all on the visual front do something to help your lighting situation those webcams require a lot of light and they generally prefer if the entire room is evenly lit and so a lot of times if you're doing a shot uh, you know if you're doing an interview or a discussion during the day what I recommend is if you can, orient your laptop or your computer with its back to a window, preferably a large window. 
uh, with sunlight coming in. And probably not direct sunlight, but indirect sunlight would be best just because you then get a very even nice soft light that comes in and fills your room, lights you up. That's probably the best thing you can do for a webcam. That's really what they're made for, and that's what their exposure algorithms are optimized for. And so that's probably the best way to do it. Do not put a window behind you in as much as possible. That will just confuse the camera and it will end up looking very bad. And then the next thing I would do is if you don't, if you're not in a position where you can spend any money or invest in a, you know, a microphone, I would just at least use your earbuds. And, and there, this solves actually two problems. Number one, rather than having your remote, the remote participant um, playing back through speakers to you and then echoing back into your microphone and making a, a very ugly, <laughs> unpleasant experience uh, from an audio point of view. Yeah, sometimes sometimes Skype doesn't cancel that. Sometimes it does, other times it doesn't. Exactly right. So that's one problem that using earbuds solves. The second problem is it gets the microphone much closer to the sound source, which is you. And so it will, even though it's not an amazing microphone, it will sound a whole lot better than a microphone that is even just an arm's reach away from you in a webcam or on your computer. And so that these can solve those two problems very quickly. So that's one thing. Pluto's atmosphere appears to be collapsing much more dramatically than scientists had anticipated. Pluto's atmosphere appears to be collapsing much more dramatically than scientists had anticipated. Pluto's atmosphere appears to be collapsing much more dramatically than scientists had anticipated. Pluto's atmosphere appears to be collapsing much more dramatically than scientists had anticipated. Pluto's atmosphere appears to be collapsing much more dramatically than scientists had anticipated. Uh, aside from that, there are some USB microphones you can get, which will, you know, pretty drastically improve the sound of your audio, especially if you're able to position it appropriately. So for example, you and I here today, we're both using microphones that are within probably five or six inches of our mouths, mm -hmm. maybe what, uh, 20 centimeters, probably 15 centimeters, somewhere yeah, in that yeah, range. Yeah. And so that's that's another one of the kind of cardinal rules of audio engineering. You get the microphone relatively close to the sound source, and that makes a huge, huge difference. You're, you're, you will hear more of the kind of a, a richer rendition of the sound source, my voice or your voice or whomever we're talking about, you'll get less of the sound that reflects off of the walls or the floor or the ceiling of the room that you're in and get back into the microphone. So it just overall, it just really improves things. So microphone placement is a very big deal. USB microphones, you can buy a very good one, something like a Rode NT USB mini. Um, that costs about $100 US. If you put it in a position like this, it sounds like a professional microphone and it's mm. very simple to use. So even with very simple solutions like that, you can make a big, big difference. Again, even with uh, external microphones like this, make sure you're using headphones, again, that to prevent that sound from playing out of your speakers and getting back into the microphone. It just makes a, a just makes it much more pleasant for, for whoever's on the other end of the, of the meeting or the recording. So overall, it's a better idea to just do the the Skype call from a mobile phone rather than using a computer, essentially, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Because sometimes you get fancy, f funny, funny noise from the computer, like some buzz, but because the preamps are probably bad in the sound card, uh, often they are. It depends. Potentially, um, at least in yeah. my computer, they are rubbish. <laughs> you bring up another good point too, though. Another thing that can happen with uh, computers, depending on your computer, is um, especially fa uh, laptops have fans in them, and if the f if the computer is working hard, uh, it can have a tendency to kick that fan on, and that will be another noise source in your room that gets picked up by the microphone, which you use best to avoid if you can. And also electrical noise, like buds, uh, what's yep. the name of it? Um, ground hum, loops. Hum, hum, yes. Hum, ground yeah. loops, buzz, yeah, yeah all those yeah. things, yeah. Yeah. For sure. As I mentioned before, Skype calls are limited to, I think, 1.2 megabits per second uh, for the video, and for the audio, I think it's 30, 30 kilobits, uh, kilobits per second for voice calls. I see you very well. Uh, you look good, <laughs> your sound is good, but uh, sometimes it doesn't really sound good. I could see a difference in the podcast that you did. So you were talking to, I think, the Garcia brothers? 
Uh-huh. And yep. uh, so you were very clear. You So you were streaming the thing directly into YouTube using uh, StreamYard, right? And then right. you were getting their feed from from Skype, right? No, actually, they so the way, the way StreamYard works, it's a web-based platform. And I connect to it and they connect it to it. Okay. The problem we ran into with them is that they hadn't set their sound up appropriately on their side. So <laughs> so we had originally, they, on their side, they had set up three microphones, one for each of the guests. Uh, what had happened was what we learned the hard way uh, that StreamYard will only recognize the first audio source on an audio interface, regardless of how many channels it can support. And so what ended up happening there is we had to default to one microphone. And then on top of that, um, our engineer hadn't uh, set the input level or the gain level loud enough. So I was talking at the same level that we're talking at here but their gain or input level is set much lower. And so it it was very difficult for the audience to hear. And we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about mastering but or, or mixing, but uh, I was very loud and they were very faint. And so it made for a very unpleasant experience for the audience. And so what we did is in real time during that <laughs> live stream, asked the engineer on the other side to increase the gain. And eventually we got it to a point where it was much more even, much more pleasant to listen to. But still, it looks like uh, the bandwidth that you have uh, when you upload to into YouTube is much larger than the bandwidth that you were getting from their feed. Part of it was their camera framing. You know, they were they were much farther from the camera, and they were wider. They were framed wider, so you know we're, we're trying to fit three people into a frame, and here it's just one person into a frame. That's one factor, but that's probably a minor factor. Uh, the lighting makes a huge difference, and then I think bandwidth makes a big difference as well. So I don't know what they were, what the feed, you know, the network speed from their location was like, but in my particular case here, I have a 100 megabit fiber to the home, okay. so that's that's usually plenty of bandwidth. Now, normally on YouTube, the the optimal uh, bandwidth for from a YouTube perspective or the most that it can support really is somewhere if, if I understand correctly for HD 1920 by 1080 resolution is about six megabits per second so it's basically three times what Skype is yeah and that generally unless you're moving around a whole lot and stressing the codec uh, generally that's going to be enough to get a much clearer and cleaner look is there any solution in terms of a broadcasting solution so that you can use a larger bandwidth there are um, and, and many of them actually have just popped up over the last few months during the pandemic. <laughs> and perhaps perhaps they were in the works prior to that, I don't know. But one of them, uh, one is called Riverside.fm. Riverside.fm is mainly focused on recording podcasts, but you can also live stream if you choose to. The thing that's unique about that is A, it supports a much higher bandwidth image. So if you have more bandwidth uh, with your internet connection, you can take up more of that bandwidth for your image and for your audio. It uses a much higher codec or much higher quality codec for the audio. And um, it also, if you are recording instead of streaming, it will actually record each of the video feeds. So me and my remote guest, it will record both of us independently to separate files. And it will record our audio separately as well. And so what that means is in, if you decided to come back later and edit that in post, you would have these essentially isolated video and audio tracks that you could then edit very carefully like you normally would. I was thinking, okay, maybe there is someone that wants uh, to, uh, so I'm the host, there is a guest, uh, we want to record a podcast or some conversation, and then I want to send this person some equipment. But let's say that this person lives in the US or New Zealand as I did recently. What would you suggest? What, sh- what shall I send this person? Maybe I buy that on Amazon, uh, something that is below 100 pounds or $100, let's say. What would you send this person? Most likely I would send them uh, a USB microphone, like, I disc- like we talked about before. The Rode. Yeah, the Rode. Rode is a great choice, I think. It's a very simple device. It's easy to use. It's as long as you get it positioned correctly. And you could talk the person through positioning it correctly, you know, once you got on for the sound check, or, you know, right before recording. So you could talk them through it and it's pretty straightforward. And that's, that's going to make the biggest difference in terms of sound quality. What I will also note is something that you've done very well too, by my own observation, is that prior to this session, you sent a document that had recommendations on how to set up. And so in that document, you had some very specific things about what I could do in terms of lighting. And fortunately for me, it wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> it was not a stretch because I was already pretty well set up for it. But 
Um, you even had some specific re recommendations in terms of the angle you wanted the light coming from and so on and so forth. And that actually was really helpful. And I think having something like that for someone, you could, you could, you could simplify it a bit for someone who doesn't have any AV experience, but still end up with a pretty high quality image. I had the different levels, the basic, the <laughs> average, and the advanced, <laughs> so that you can choose. Did I get the? Did I get? Did I get the intermediate or did I get the advanced? I mean, you're uh, you're you're a pro, so. <laughs> 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 so yeah, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, well something about me. Uh, so I started with these uh, uh, productions about four years ago, doing some uh, promotional videos actually for myself and my projects, and then I decided to expand on that. And I come from science, and uh, so I just wanted to know a little bit about you. Uh, you also come sort of from science, right? Yeah. So my my undergraduate degree is in psychology. Then I started a doctoral program in clinical psychology. And uh, at that point, I realized about two years into the program that it was it was not a good fit for me. It was not something I wanted to pursue long term as a career, like I had originally thought. However, what I did pick up in that were just some fascinating courses that I got to take. And working with an advisor on the master's thesis, that was really there were a lot of things that I really learned. I think largely about myself, and I think one of the things I learned was that statistical analysis and modeling was very fascinating to me. That was kind of the route I ended up getting more interested in than cl clinical work. <laughs> and then, all, you know, all this time on the side, I was also a photographer and my brother's a musician. So I was always involved in visual imaging and, you know, recording sound as well. So what ended up happening is that after that, as far as career, I ended up going back and getting an information systems degree, a master's degree. Um, after I bailed out of the uh, doctoral program and then ended up working for tech companies after that. So that's what I do. Even to today, I'm still a product manager at a software company. And then I also have a, my basically my side business where I teach people how to do lighting and sound for video. And uh, you also have a, a course online on, on your website. What's that about? Can you give me a brief summary of that? Yep. Most of those are focused on how to produce better sound for video. So I have courses on how to use specific recorders, how to do overall, just a more general kind of sound for film and video course. I have one on post-processing. So once you've, rec after you're done recording, there's a whole set of things you can do in post-production to optimize the sound. Um, and then I also have, again, as I mentioned, a, a number of courses on how to use specific audio recorders or mixers. And um, those have actually, those have been a lot of fun to put together. and. Hopefully they've helped a lot of people too. You're uh, you're selling these courses from your website, right? You don't use mm -hmm. uh, platforms like Udemy or is there any reason for that? Yes. Um I I well first of all Udemy is Udemy's having a rough time I think because I think Udemy takes a very large portion of the proceeds of the sales. So um what I'm using is a different platform called Teachable and what Teachable does is that at the volume that I'm selling it makes more sense from the standpoint that I get to keep a lot more of the earnings, but I also get, and I don't know as much about Udemy because this is a, you know, research I did years ago before I chose a platform, but um, I, I have a lot more control over um, the audience in terms of how I can contact them and stay in touch with them. Because one of the things that to me was very important about online courses is that there's a massive problem with online courses. And that problem is, is that if your students get stuck, there's generally not a way to, to help them very well. And so what I did as part of the course offering is I have weekly live streams where we can do question and answer. So as part of that, um, you know, that, 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 that gave me a, enough control on the teachable side that I could do something like that and, and offer that additional value to my audience, which was, you know, if you get stuck and you have a question, well, you can always email me, but we also have these question and answer sessions once a week to help get you unstuck and, and moving forward. I want to move to the sort of setups that we have here. Uh, I've got an Aptur uh, Lightstorm there. And then I've got the C200 there. And the C200 behind me. Now the cool thing of the C200 is that it's, it's mounted on a jib, on a portable jib. It's an Edelkron jib with the head. And uh, I think it does a great job. And then what else? I also have a Mix Pre 3 here. And the Sennheiser's uh, 416. Basically, that's it. And two wireless uh, Sennheiser uh, 
AVXME2. I'm not very good with names. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what do you have there? Uh, so today we're being recorded also by a Canon C200 is the camera that we're looking at here. And I have an interesting, my, my setup's a little bit different. So I have, in terms of lighting, I have a, a similar, I have a panel LED light. This is a DNO lighting 180W. The reason I use that is twofold. Number one, it has a soft box on it, so it softens up the light a little bit, uh, which is good for when you're shooting talking head because it, it it's a little bit more flattering on a person's face. And then secondly, the reason I like this light, and I think it's similar with your light as well, is that it doesn't have a fan in it, so it's not producing noise uh, while we're recording, which is really helpful. Uh, from here... Uh, and actually, this is where things get a little more sophisticated or perhaps complex. I'm not sure, but let me explain to you. I, I don't think I've explained this to you before, but I have uh, right here. This is an Earthworks SR314. It's a condenser microphone that is routed into uh, an audio interface that's connected to my computer. It's a Universal Audio Apollo X6. This interface actually does some interesting things in terms of processing the audio. It's actually compressing the audio a little bit and loudness, bringing the loudness up a little bit and, and making it more consistent, but it's also applying a little bit of equalization. And then that sends the audio to my computer, which is what you're hearing on Skype, because we're, we're talking here on Skype. But at the same time, it's also sending the audio directly to my camera and recording this audio that's already been processed and ready to go into my camera. So when I give you, Sam, the, the video files, you will actually already have the embedded audio of what we're recording here today. So that's the setup I'm using here right now. Does it do any adaptive, adaptive denoising? It does not do any denoising, no. And fortunately in my room here, I think we have enough control over things that we don't need to do a lot of denoising, but you can always do a little bit in post if you're concerned about anything you hear. And how about the, the, the computer there? Do you have any fans there? Or do, is it loud? Because my computer there, it's a, it's very loud, so I had to put it behind, put it behind the, the curtains. Yeah, good, good question. This is actually an iMac Pro, and it does not, the fan only ever comes on when I'm exporting a big video file, but otherwise it's very quiet. I saw your video about the Mix Minus on Sound Devices uh, Mix Pre 6 and 3, I think it was, maybe 6. The Mix Pre 3 is great. There's a great preamps, right? Unprecedented. In fact, the quality of the preamplifiers and the and the audio gear that we're seeing today at that kind of a price. So the Mix Pre 3, for example, is a $650 yeah. um, field recorder. And it has preamplifiers that normally, you know, in the past, probably five years ago or 10 years ago, you would have to purchase a $3,000 to $5,000 mixer or recorder to get that same quality. I, I remember that uh, one of the first uh, videos that we did, kind of professional videos, and this person came with the uh, Tascam, I think, and uh, two Rode microphones, and I didn't like that. And it was too noisy. <laughs> and then I got these things with these mics, and that changed my, my life, my experience. Yes, yeah. and it probably made it a lot easier for you, right? Yeah, mean, you yeah. don't have to do as much post-processing. It's just, it's basically very close to where you need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right yeah. out of the recorder. Yeah. yeah. So sound, you said that uh, sound makes or breaks your video. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, well, I think, so George Lucas is famous for saying that sound is 50% of the experience in, in relation to film, is what he was talking about. And I um, I don't know if I was joking, perhaps, perhaps it's a joke, perhaps it's not, but I actually think that sound, despite, despite what people might, might actually think at a conscious level, that they actually, we rely on our, on our ability to hear much more than we real, realize. And in fact, Sometimes I say that sound is actually 60% of the experience. And, and actually, if you, look at, if you look at auditory capabilities from a more like from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, sound really helps us in a lot more ways than we realize. It helps us to make decisions about where things are in relation to ourselves. So as we're walking down a street, for example, our, our brain is making these split second decisions about, okay, audio, this sound that I'm hearing is coming to this ear you know, just a few milliseconds sooner than it's getting to this year, that tells me something about where that, what, where that sound source is located in relation to where I am. These are judgments that we can make as human beings. And I think a lot of us don't realize that at a conscious level, how important that is and how much a part of the human experience that is for us. And so 
I think what what the kind of the manifestation we see of that is if you watch a video, for example, online somewhere, and the audio quality is poor, it it becomes for us it it feels like an amateurish job or not even an amateur. Amateur is a is a bad word to use because amateur can actually mean a very good thing, <laughs> um, but it's it's just like a very poor quality job, and so. The credibility of the piece, or if it's a if it's a fiction piece, the ability for that piece to suspend my disbelief is diminished greatly, and so it just becomes a much it's just not as an effective an experience for most people. So that's that's my perspective. Is that's why sound is so important? Is that humans, whether we realize it consciously or not, we rely on our sound or our ability to hear so much more than we realize, and so providing a quality sonic experience for your audience i think is critical and that and i don't mean that just from the standpoint of fiction pieces or narrative film i mean that from sales presentations i mean that from the perspective of business meetings you need to respect your audience enough to not assault their ears you need to provide them a decent experience as far as sound is concerned so wear your headphones use a decent mic get it close <laughs> be respectful I hope this will convince uh, my <laughs> collaborators. <laughs> um, so you have a great microphone there. I really like that. I really like the sound. How would you compare that microphone uh, with this Sennheiser uh, 416? Uh, the Sennheiser 416 is, was actually made for a very specific purpose, and it's been reused for different purposes. So for example, that was originally designed in the 1970s. It's gone through a few different iterations, but really it's, a, it's what co is called a shotgun microphone. And the reason for that if you look up close on it, you'll see it's a very long microphone, mm. first of all, but it has this tube with slits along the side. And as a physicist, you could probably explain how that works better than I can, but the the net effect of that particular microphone design is very directional. So it is very good at picking up the sound right in front of it, but it's very also very good at rejecting a lot of any other sound sources that come off to the sides. So that's what kind of that's one thing that makes that microphone very special. In addition to that, it, it was just well engineered. And so it just sounds really good. It has a very rich low end to it. And it also is very articulate uh, in the higher frequencies. And so it sounds overall very nice in most circumstances. Um, so the difference is this microphone was actually originally designed as a handheld performance microphone. For music. For music, yes, yes. Um, but it's also, it's made by an interesting, this one's actually made by an American company that's made by a German company. Um, this is made by an American company called Earthworks. The engineer that started Earthworks, he also started the company called DBX, which makes audio gear as well. He has a long uh, history as a renowned audio engineer. Uh, but what's kind of special about this microphone to me is that its overall frequency response, how it re responds to different frequencies, is generally pleasing on most voices. It's, it works really, really nicely with almost every voice that I've had. And you did a video about that. You were showing uh, it, it has... A cardioid uh, polar pattern. Yeah, polar pattern. You were rotating it and mm -hmm. showing it. Yeah, so this one is a it's a little different because it, it it it's actually more forgiving. So if I yeah. move off to the side here, it's going to pick me up. It, like if you move off to the side there, you're going to fall off pretty quickly in terms of the sound pickup. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this one's a little bit more forgiving, but it is still very good at rejecting sound from the back of the microphone. So that's important in this case, for example, because I have a computer screen right here. I have a desk just below it, and so what I do is I intentionally aim the microphone not only so that it's you know, picking up the sound of my voice, but also that the part of the microphone that picks up the least amount of sound is aimed at these flat surfaces, which will reflect the sound of my voice. And so it's going to be better at rejecting any of those kind of reflected sounds. So overall results in a better sounding experience. And of course, microphones cannot, can, cannot fix your uh, speech defects or my accent, for example. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to correct my Italian accent, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I quite like your Italian accent, so I'm glad it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Key components to achieve uh, sound quality. I mean, I think it's a microphone, hardware, room, and post-processing, right? I mean, would you add anything else or...? I, I would actually just to kind of, I, I agree with that. And I would just kind of clarify a few things uh, in regards to that. So I think room is a bigger thing than most people realize. The, the room in which you make a sound recording probably has a bigger, makes a bigger impact on the overall quality of the sound than anything else. Now, the other thing that makes a big difference is how close the microphone is to the sound source. So um, I would say that's even probably more important than the particular microphone that you're using is how close it is to the sound of your voice. 
Uh, and then from there, I think the there is a, there is an art to choosing a microphone which complements your voice. So, for example, on my voice, I have a lot of what's called sibilance. So when I say the letter S, like seashells, she sells seashells by the seashore, that S tends to be really kind of sib it has a sizzling sort of sound to it that can kind of start to distort. Um, and so finding a microphone that suits your particular voice is one thing. Some people have very deep voices without a lot of articulation, in which case they would probably benefit very much from a microphone like what you have, which incidentally, I think complements your voice very nicely. You have a what I would call a kind of a darker voice where you have a bit more, well, and it's a good thing, I think. Actually, it's a very nice sound. A lot of voiceover artists have a, a voice like yours. It has a, a little bit more uh, kind of bass and not quite as much high frequency content to it. And so it has this really warm kind of inviting sound to it. So the the nice thing about the Sennheiser MKH-416, which you're using, is that it is very sensitive in those higher frequencies. So while your voice doesn't produce a lot of those frequencies, it's very good at picking up what, what you have produced with your voice. Um, it's very sensitive up there. And so it complements your voice very nicely. So the trick with that is though, if you're if you're just getting start started in sound recording or you're not that invested, you're just going to do an interview with Sam every once in a while, <laughs> then you might, you know, for you, you, you're probably not up to spending, you know, several hundred dollars trying out different microphones to find the perfect microphone for your voice. But um, something again, like that USB microphone we mentioned earlier, that's going to work well for almost every voice. Again, getting a decent room or treating your room in some fashion. Um, and then getting that microphone close. Those are the two biggest things I would say. Yeah, so in terms of room, as you can see here, I've got uh, some relatively cheap curtains. And mm -hmm. I was actually surprised by the fact that I could find uh, very cheap curtains that don't look yes. bad. They look uh, reasonably nice. And they do. I yep. used uh, some uh, rails, uh, curtain rails, and that's it. And this, now, the thing is that this... Uh, these ones are not particularly thick, but because of the because of the shape they get, uh, mm -hmm. they tend to absorb the sound in a, in, a, in a better way than rather than having simply walls. What would you suggest to improve these sort of uh, setups? Would you recommend these things that you have behind you? Can you just can you tell me what those things are? Yeah, so right behind me here. Yeah. So these are these are called uh, broadband traps. They're made out of a fiberglass type of material, fairly dense fiberglass material. I have some in the corners as well as along the walls. The main idea with these is to um, absorb sounds to keep them to keep the sound waves from bouncing around the room, bouncing off of walls, bouncing off of floors and ceilings. I have some up on the ceiling as well. Now, you know, if you're going to do professional audio work, then yes, I would recommend these. <laughs> did you run a simulation of your room? Did you do a software simulation? of? I actually did some testing. Okay. I had a, I have a test microphone, and so we took some test measurements. And then I also worked with an acoustician to help design the, the base, you know, the, the trapping plan for the room here. Um, and in fact, we ended up with two, you can't see them here, but there's two very large sets of traps in the corner up at the front of the room here. And then um, we have several along the wall back here. We have two more up, up on the ceiling, which we called clouds. And then we have some on the back wall as well. The ones on the back wall are much thicker. And so the idea with uh, the trap, as I mentioned, is a lot of times people will call them base traps. Um, that's kind of a vernacular term that isn't super accurate. I guess what, what they're emphasizing there is that the the traps that are made specifically with the you know the technical specifications to be able to absorb bass frequencies is important because a lot of times what people will do is they'll put up a bunch of foam on the walls like acoustic foam and the trick with acoustic foam is it's very good at eliminating or absorbing high frequency sound but it is not good at absorbing low frequency sound and so what ends up happening is especially in smaller rooms like you and I are working in here um one of the biggest problems tends to be bass and the buildup of bass and the kind of the resulting comb filtering that happens so that when you have all these different frequencies, they start to interact with each other and you start to get comb filtering effects and it can even start to sound like a warbling effect if it's bad enough. So you get these and you get flutters and you get these other, all these other things. But I think if, if someone needs to do something on a budget, what you can do is just use any sort of blanket or curtains. I think your solution is very good. 
um, it, because it, it has it serves a visual purpose and uh, an audio purpose. So it's a good fit that way. And I think when you're recording, and there are different there are different um, considerations for recording versus having setting up a mixing room where you're going to be listening back to pre-recorded material. So for recording, the biggest thing is to get those early reflections or those first reflections. So when you're when the sound of your voice goes out, what you want to do is be able to trap it before it bounces off of a hard surface and comes back into the microphone. And so any sort of blankets that you can hang up in the room will help in front of the, you know, especially in front of the, the flat walls. If you have a hard floor, um, putting a blanket down on the floor for the course of the recording can help. And a lot of people come to me and say, hey, I want to I want to make my room sound better, but I can't uh, permanently attach anything to the walls. That's where I would say, OK, a sound blanket or any sort of blanket you can put on the floor on a hard floor or hang up on the in the room off camera. Those can only make a, you know, make things better and, and help manage that reflection. And so you said the position of those uh, traps, those base traps. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there are softwares that tell you where to put those things. It was an acoustic, yeah, it was an acoustics engineer that helped me with that. So the acoustics engineer looked at the dimensions of the room and I did some measurements of the room with a, with a test microphone. And what you do is essentially is you send a, a, a frequency sweep out of your speakers. So it goes, you know, up through the whole frequency range. And uh, the measurement microphone measures the response of the room when that sound is put into it. And based on that, the acoustician then has, uh, you know, some, can, can make some educated, informed decisions about where it may be best to put some of these traps. And so there's constraints, obviously. The, the, this room was not built for acoustics. It was a spare bedroom in my in my home. And so I've got a window right behind me here. I've got another window. Uh, these are curtains here that are blocking a window behind me. So, you know, you have to work around those constraints, but there are things you can do. And, and I think uh, we would probably, I think we'd probably send people to you with your physics background to help them sort through those issues. <laughs> yeah, I should look into acoustics more. I don't know anything about acoustics. I should probably research yes. more. And uh, <laughs> so when you go on location, uh, when, you're shooting, when you're shooting something, let's say in some company office, uh, what do you do? Do you carry anything to help with the sound processing? Or? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, sound blankets are, are definitely my friend. There's, there are companies that make Blankets that are specifically engineered to help eliminate some of the the reflected sound. Uh, you can use any sort of blanket. A lot of times, people will use moving blankets. These are the blankets you wrap around furniture when you're moving. Uh, but the the problem with those is it, it depends on them. You can get some that will work effectively for acoustic treatment as well. But generally, they're made to be very lightweight, and so that's not going to do a whole lot in terms of absorbing sound. So. The acoustic blankets are much heavier. They're made out of cotton. They actually have been through laboratory testing and they've identified, okay, this has a noise reduction coefficient of, you know, X, Y, Z at these different frequencies. And so I'll carry those around and usually put them up on a, what's called a C stand or a sentry stand. It's just, a, it's a stand that's made for lighting usually. And I can put that up in the room off camera and that helps reduce some of that reflected sound. I don't remember if it was you. It was probably you. You probably did the video where you showed these uh, blankets. And you said that they were smelling bad, that you had to yes, wash. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing. There. <laughs> what uh, well, it, it was a it was a serious problem. It, it seems like it had been treated with some heavy duty chemicals of oh. some sort. But I contact the actually the company contacted me after I made that video, and they said, "Hey, we had a problem with some of our earlier shipments. So some of the the manufacturing, which was done in China, had they had applied some sort of chemical. We apologize for that. Here's some new blankets." And uh, when they sent the new blankets out, they didn't have that smell to them. So <laughs> evidently they had uh, changed their manufacturing process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now coming to audio post-processing, uh, just briefly tell you what I normally do. Uh, if I'm treating uh, sound, I normally do that in uh, Audition, Adobe Audition. And I remove noise with the uh, noise processing. And then I normalize to minus 3 dB. And then I basically go point by point and then remove if there are uh, unwanted noises and then i usually i do a hard limit to minus six six db and then i probably apply a um, noise gate just to avoid removing the breaks between words or uh, uh, sentences what do you do normally what's your uh, typical workflow 
Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. I actually just documented this earlier today for another question that somebody asked. Um, so typically I will, I, I try to do as little processing as possible. Um, and if I have done the recording myself, oftentimes that's, that's possible. But if I'm on location, that's where things get a little more challenging. You don't always have control over the location. And so that's where things, you, you're going to pick up more noise. So typically what I do is I apply a high pass filter. And what a high pass, pass filter is, is it's, it, it uh, removes some of the lowest frequency energy. So I just apply that at about 50 hertz. Generally, voices, you know, dialogue doesn't sit there. So it's just getting rid of any sort of rumble, such as um, cars or air conditioning, airplanes, things of that nature. So yes. Uh, if I do need to do noise reduction, I will then do it at that point. I generally use Isotope RX, which is a an application that is used a lot in the film industry for cleaning audio. And it has a very good noise reduction algorithm, which does a very good job. And my goal there typically is not to eliminate the noise, but to reduce it some, just so that it's not distracting. Because what happens if you press it too hard, even the best algorithms today will start to affect the quality of the dialogue sound at some point. You'll start to sound like you're underwater. You hear those <laughs> Exactly. Exactly <laughs> I don't know right. That. Yeah. It's a, you know, the algorithm can't differentiate in all cases between all noise and, you know, because a lot of noise is broadband. It's across the entire audio spectrum. And so, you know, your voice has to live in there somewhere. So anyway, so just applying that very lightly is is the best bet there. I also do something, a lot of men's voices in particular. And you'll see this with some instruments as well, that they create what are called asymmetric waveforms. So if you think of an audio wave that's going up and down, you have a center line. And that's that's kind of the, the you know, the way it works is as the audio waveform goes up, this determines how loud the sound is. And then how quickly or slowly it goes up and down determines its frequency or, you know, whether it's a low noise or a high pitched noise. And what happens in, with, in some cases, is that a lot of times with men's voices in particular, I find the waveform will be much taller, larger in amplitude on one side than it will be on the other. So it will just go like this. And what that means in practical terms is that once you apply, say for example, you normalize, you're not getting all of the headroom available because one side is so much larger than the other. So I typically, I also have a tool within a dose, and, uh, sorry, Isotope RX, which does what's called adaptive phase rotation. So it will even up that asymmetry in the waveform. And it, usually I'll be able to get back a, a fair bit of headroom, which makes it so I can make the audio louder without affecting the timbre of the sound too much. So that's another thing I do. Um, normally I will, I will normalize to a loudness standard or a perceived loudness standard as opposed to peak normalize. And peak normalize is all that does is it looks at all the samples in the audio at any given point in time. It looks for the highest amplitude sample and it says okay i'm going to i'm going to move that up however much you said to to minus 3 db say for example however much i had to move to get that to minus 3 db i'm going to also move all of the other samples up that same amount the challenge with normalizing that way is that it it's going to change from recording to recording so if i normalize all of uh, you know say i have a series of six different audio recordings and i normalize all of them to minus 3 db perceptually they will sound different in terms of how loud they are. Some of them will sound louder than others. And so uh, more recently, we've seen some measurement systems come out for what is called perceptual loudness. And they're, they're usually done in the, in the form of loudness units full scale or loudness units K-weighted full scale. And what these do is they measure the overall loudness of an audio file much more closely to how we as humans perceive loudness. Because if you have a if you have a waveform and it goes up, say it goes up really loud, it goes amplitude wise, it goes to minus one dB on a digital scale. If it only goes up once to that loudness level and we hear it played back, it doesn't sound actually that loud. It's only if it persists at that amplitude for a longer period of time that it starts to sound loud to us. And so that's there, there's some very important distinctions there. And so measuring and normalizing based on these loudness units full scale gets you more consistent results in terms of perceived loudness. And so that's what I'll typically do is just to, for now, I might just loudness normalize to minus 26 LUFS. And that just gets me to a starting point where I can start processing the audio. At that point, I'll often re, I'll apply some um, corrective EQ. So for example, 
everyone's voice is different. Every microphone is different. Every room is different. And so when you record a voice into a microphone in a room, sometimes you get these resonances. And these resonances don't always sound good. Sometimes they sound great. Other times they don't sound good at all. And so what equalization does is it allows you to find those resonances and pull them down a little bit so they don't sound... Um, so for example, when you hear a recording that sounds very nasally, that's because there's a a resonance of some sort in that nasal range. And if you can find that using an equalizer and pull that down, it will sound much more balanced and more pleasant to listen to. So that's typically what I'll do next. And usually with a lot of voices and, and depending on the room you're recording in, it's not unusual to find at least two, maybe three different resonances in someone's voice that um, for that particular recording that you can pull down that will then improve the sound of the of the audio quite nicely. Um, from there, then I will start to prepare for the um, what we would call mastering stage. So um, what I'm looking to do there is to get a consistent loudness. So when I publish a video one week, and then I go back the next week and I publish another video, I want my audience to be able to listen to the first one and set their volume level, and then play the second one and not have to adjust their volume level again. It should be very consistent in terms of sound. And that's what that's really what mastering does to a large extent. Um, is it allows you to do that. And so the mastering stage, I'll often do some compression on the audio where I'll be, you know, any of those, what we call transients, where the waveform goes up and comes down very quickly, um, which we call a transient. Again, those aren't necessarily helping. <laughs> they don't necessarily sound loud um, because they happen so quickly. And a lot of times I'll compress those down. So I'll pull those down. And what that allows me to do then is to take the overall audio file and increase its overall amplitude without clipping. Because as soon as an audio gets up to zero dB, which is the maximum in a digital scale, it clips and it starts to sound distorted. So we're trying to avoid that as well. So once I've done that compression, um, then I might come back and do another pass of equalization. In this particular case though, when I come back to do the second round of equalization, I'm not so much trying to fix problems as maybe sweeten the overall sound of the voice. So for example, if it's a, a men's voice and I want it to have a very intimate sound, I might boost the bass just a tiny bit just to make it sound a little warmer and more intimate. Um, in, if I have a voice that seems to be a little bit lacking in terms of articulation, I might bump up some of the mid to high frequencies a little bit so that they sound a little clearer. So there's some things you can do there as well. If there are any mouth clicks, you know, a lot of times people will go... And that kind of stuff can become very annoying. <laughs> so you can you can actually cut some of that out, um, and not so much by actually cutting it, but there are plugins you can use to to declick that noise, take that click away. Um, a lot of times too, I will do a deep breath, and so instead of a noise gate, I'll use a deep breath plugin. Rather, a noise gate is just trying to detect when you're talking and when you're not talking, and when you're not talking, it will basically reduce those levels, and that can be fine. But what a deep breath plugin does is it specifically looks for breath. So it's looking for specific frequencies that are much quieter than the talking parts. So it's a little bit more sophisticated in its detection. And then it pulls those breaths down a little bit just so they're not so annoying. And I, and I find generally that you don't want to remove the breaths because otherwise it starts to sound unnatural. But you don't want them to be super prominent either. So you just pull them down just a little bit. And that's oftentimes in my experience post-processing it's more about subtlety. Subtle changes make the biggest difference. If you get too hardcore and you start pushing too hard on the plugins and changing the sound too dramatically, it starts to sound very unnatural and very unpleasant. And then after I've done those steps, then the final step is to, to loudness normalize. And so that's where I will, for example, if I'm publishing to the, to the web, somewhere on the web, normally what you're aiming for is a target of about minus 16 LUFS. And what that will ensure is that when someone is listening to your content on a plane or in a subway, train, taxi, a car, um, which is a very poor listening environment typically, and they're often listening with earbuds, <laughs> which are not the best, and they're listening on consumer grade devices like mobile phones, which don't have the best um, audio processing and amplification and so on and so forth. If you get the audio to a good consistent level and sounding good at minus 16 LUFS, it'll play back nicely in those environments as well. So that's usually kind of the, that's the overview, I guess, yeah, of my yeah, post-processing. Yeah. 16, minus 16 is super loud. My, well, my, well, it's, it's all relative. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The, the music services are normalizing to like minus 13 and minus 14 okay. LUFS, okay. even louder. 
And the problem is, is minus 16 is a good middle ground if you're publishing specifically for something that will be consumed on a mobile device or mm. on the web somewhere with a laptop or on a phone, mostly on a phone these days. And so those are very poor playback systems, to be entirely honest. And so you do have to push. Th so there's always a trade-off. The louder you go, the less dynamic range your audio will have. And what I mean by that is if somebody whispers and then they shout, you know, that's kind of the dynamic range. That's, that's an illustration of the width of, you know, you can capture the whispers and you can capture the, the shouts as well. If you do this loudness normalization, you're getting rid of some of that dynamic range as in, in the effort to make it louder. So there's a kind of a balanced trade-off there. Now, if I'm going to produce something that's going to be viewed in a theater, I want to keep a lot more of that dynamic range because we're going to be working with a playback system that's much more capable, that's much better. And, and, the, and the whole listening environment is set up to be much better as well. That's why movies always sound so much better than yeah, <laughs> typically what yeah. you're going to watch on your phone. And so in that case, I might just normalize to minus 24 LUFS okay. as opposed to minus 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when it comes to mastering with music, have you done anything about that? That's another art, I guess. Uh, That's another art. Yeah, yeah. very that, difficult. That I'm not a, well. I mean, I I I have mixed some films, and uh, for me, the the approach to mastering is very simple. It's more about loudness and consistency than it is about. In music, mastering takes on a, an entirely different meaning or mm. a, an additional meaning as well, where they're doing more. Not only are they are they optimizing the loudness of the music, but they're also they're like a next level mixer almost. They're 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 making sure that the different instruments are managed a little bit differently so that they get the different effect that they're looking for. Um it's it's a little bit ephemeral, the description. So they try to match the is. frequencies of different instruments so that they they sound well when they are played together. Maybe you need to remove I think so. a bit of frequency here, yeah. a bit of frequency there. Yeah, I think there's some of, there's definitely some of that going on as well. And I think Sometimes the mixing engineer will do some of that. Sometimes the mastering engineer will do some of that. So it's a little bit of a shared responsibility depending on the situation. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. What setup are you using for the live stream at the moment? Yeah. So I have a, I have a switcher. So I have a, an overhead camera. So a lot of times my live streams are more educational in nature. So what I'm trying to do is demonstrate products and how to operate them. And so I'll have my main camera. That'll usually be my Canon C200. And then I'll have the overhead camera that's looking down on my desk so I can just you know, show the product and how to operate it. And then I have a, what's called a switcher, which basically both of those cameras are connected to the switcher. And then I can just push a button to switch between the two different cameras. In addition to that, the switcher enables me to have a um, basically a program monitor so I can see which camera is currently active, which one's not active. And it also has a multi-view, which allows me to see um, some additional information. I can actually show all of the available cameras, what's currently happening on each of the available cameras. I can do uh, a more sophisticated type of switching. I don't do this typically because I am the one that's operating my live stream. Ah, nobody helps. <laughs> I don't have okay. a. Okay. No, 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 nobody helps. So it's just me. If somebody else were helping me, it has a mode that would be better suited. You know, you've seen TV shows or movies, for example, where. You see a director sitting in a back room. They have all the different cameras available to them. They say, okay, switch to camera six now. And so there's someone operating the switcher and they get, they'll, they'll punch, you know, camera number six in into the preview. And then the director will say now, and then they'll hit the, you know, they'll hit the cut button and that will move over to that camera. So it's capable of doing that, but I don't, because I'm operating it all. I just put it in live cut mode. So it just cuts as soon as I choose the other camera. Um, but it also allows me to do some audio processing. So if I wanted to apply some compression, a limiter, some EQ, I can do all of that in the switcher as well. And uh, that allows me also to connect. You can potentially connect your microphone or your audio signal chain to the mixer or to the, the switcher as well. Generally, what I do is I actually run the audio directly to my camera and then send that to the switcher. So there are different ways you can do it, but that's my general setup. And, and I'm using the same kind of this room right here is, is where I do my live streams and a lot of my educational videos. And the switcher is a Blackmagic, what do you use? It is a Blackmagic ATEM Mini Pro. Hard to get. <laughs> it's hard to get it during the pandemic. Yes, it was released just at the start of the pandemic. They were incredibly popular. And if you put an order in, you might get yours in six weeks type of thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's also hard to get the Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Indeed. Very popular. 
<laughs> you got one there, right? Uh, I do. Yes, yeah. I, I actually bought that uh, shortly when it, after it came out. Although I will say, what a lot of people don't realize, I think, is that a a Canon cinema camera like the C two hundred, which you're using and I'm using, is a very different camera than the pocket cinema cameras uh, in terms of workflow. They they don't have a lot of things that a lot of people would assume they would have. They don't, for example, have autofocus. The black magic doesn't have both of yeah. Exactly. Although the Canon does have actually very good autofocus. And so it has one shot autofocus, I think. Exactly. Which basically means you can you can press a button, it will autofocus on whatever you happen to be, you know, have it aimed on at that moment in time. And then as soon as you start rolling, if the person moves, all bets are off. You have to <laughs> you have to manually yeah. refocus yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. find them again. So it's a different thing, but it's a, it's an amazing camera for its price in terms of what it's capable of doing with an operator that knows how to operate it. But it's one of those cameras that's not super easy to operate. I mean, it takes, there's some effort involved. And I've uh, been using it uh, several times with the gimbal. And I would say that it matches, it matches very well with the C, it matches very well with the C200 when you use, uh, this thing do you use these things sometimes okay. um i yeah i did make a video about them i uh depends on what i'm trying to do so if i if i if i know i'm gonna have to match cameras and they're two different or they're two cameras that i don't know how well they match yet then yes i will definitely use it then that's that's kind of the the um one of the most common use cases for something like that uh, if i'm just shooting something where I'm just using one camera. I typically won't. I'll just I'll just color grade and yeah. post and yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah, not worry too much about it from that point. And uh, so you said you mentioned the focus. Did you have uh, problems with the C two hundred autofocus? Yeah, you know it's funny. Um, so if if I'm looking directly into the camera, it doesn't seem to have a problem. It does very good at face detection autofocus. So it stays trained on my face or whomever I you know whomever I'm shooting's face. If I turn off axis just a little bit, like we're doing here in a typical interview situation where the person is not looking directly into the camera, but off to one side a little bit, it seems to have a really hard time with that. And it's funny because it seems if you turn 90 degrees to the camera like this, it seems to do better than if you're turned just off camera. Is that the same thing you've experienced? Uh, the thing I've experienced uh, is that uh, we were doing, it happened twice. Uh, we had the autofocus on with the 7200 Canon L series. Mm -hmm. And the camera was trying to, trying to chase the, f the, 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 the focus in the eyes. And it was mm -hmm. going back and forth, back and forth until I noticed that and I turned it off. And there is also a nice video done by Rubidium, uh, the Crimson engine. I spoke about mm -hmm. this. Uh, you get this problem when you are uh, with the low f stop. So if you open up, if you, or if you if you close down the lens a little bit more, it tends to do better. Is that? Yeah, just keep it in manual. That's it. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Uh, unless I'm outside and I'm moving a lot, then it does, doesn't really matter. But if there is a subject that is still, I just keep it in manual. Now there is also yeah. another thing, a nice thing. So these lenses that I'm using, are the Samyang, I guess it's a Rokin on in uh, US. Uh, mm -hmm. They are kind of entry level cinema lenses. Um, mm -hmm. This thing behind me uh, from Edelkron has got a kind of automatic uh, focus puller. So I can oh, wow. uh, switch between different directions and the thing will uh, focus on, uh, on the object. Uh, you can, there is a laser meter that uh, calculates what's the right focus. Wow. So it's, wow. it's, it's, it's very nice. So, so as the thing amazing. moves, so the thing moves now, uh, you can see it's moving. It's going to focus mm -hmm. on the screen where you are. Uh, okay. so it's going to keep you in focus. So if you were here for real, <laughs> it would keep the focus, <laughs> even though it's moving. So I think this is, uh, this is great, but, uh, it's, it's not a portable solution. I mean, you, you, you that doesn't work if you were, uh, if, if it's not in this system, um, yeah, yeah, that's surprisingly quiet too. I'm it's very, it. very quiet. The the sliders now from these guys, Edelkron, are very quiet. I think you mentioned time codes. Uh, I've been using 
I think twice or three times the tank tackle sync, which injects the the time code into into the audio uh, input. But the problem I had with that because I don't work with Mac, I only work with Windows, so it was basically useless. And it's actually, I don't know, I just use this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. And then there is also the um, there is also the Premiere Pro out auto line uh, thing that uh, aligns the shots based on the on the audio signal, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. Where do you see timecode uh, useful? And yeah, I think the the biggest place I've seen, and in, in fact, the place that I use it most. Um, is when I'm using, I'm working on a much more complex piece, usually a narrative film. So when there's a crew and there are multiple cameras and we come away from the day with, you know, 80 to 120 shots, that's when it becomes more useful. And, you know, in our case, in, in most of the production teams I work on, the post team is going to have access to a Mac. And, and to be honest, I think that with the tentacle sync, the biggest value of that package, now that the, 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 the Time code generators are fine. They're good. They're good hardware. Um, but the, a huge part of the value of purchasing those is that it comes with the Tentacle Sync Studio software, which runs on Mac. Yeah. And that is a dream to work with. Because in, the, in that case, at the end of the day, I drop my 120 video clips in, my 120 audio clips in, I push a button, boom, they're yeah. all lined up. I push a button, export an XML file that goes into my video editing app, and I am ready to go. And it's just really, it's, it's a great way to work when you're doing something like that. Now, if I'm working on a corporate piece where it is, I walk away with five clips of video and five clips of audio, I just use the Final Cut Pro or the Premiere Pro or the DaVinci Resolve auto align feature. And that's fine. It's just, at that point, I think the amount of time it takes to set up and work with a timecode workflow is just too much overhead. It only makes sense if you're going to come home with a lot of clips. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I think we can uh, close it here, unless you want to add the... No, it's been a pleasure. I, I'm so glad that you contacted me and that we were able to have our conversation. Yeah. I apologize it didn't happen sooner, but um, I'm really glad we got a chance to talk. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Take care.